Um, we are going through the book of Hebrews, and I am, I'm always, this is, this is one of the great parts of trust, is that I trust that last week Kip didn't teach you any heresy. Okay. <laughs> but I'll never know because he forgot to record, record it conveniently. So maybe there was some heresy there. I don't know. Anyway, no, that was an accident. Anyway, I, uh, we're going to read through our passage this morning. We're going to begin at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 to the end of the chapter. And one of the things I really want to encourage you to do is I've had Val put in the bulletin, the passages that we're going to cover over the next week or two. And I think it would be very fitting and appropriate to read the passage before you come on Sunday morning. Um, make it a bit the basis for maybe your me- some of your meditation during the week. Because as, even as I studied these eight or nine verses, I mean, I could have easily spent three weeks in those eight or nine verses. There's so much there. It's so rich and deep. And I believe that Sunday morning the message will penetrate much further into your heart and mind and spirit if that passage is already in your mind and it's already in your heart and you've already been meditating on it. So that's the reason that those are in the bulletin, just to encourage you so to, to perhaps just come a little more prepared than you might otherwise um, be able to do because they're written there. So let's look at chapter 2, verse 10 of Hebrews, and we'll hear the word of the Lord. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood... He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery to their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The word of the Lord. Amen. Val, are you on today? Okay, so our five-year-old through fifth graders can go uh, for their children's church time. Off they go. Now, you might be wondering why we're a little more sparse than we generally are, and one of the reasons is is that our teenagers, who are usually sitting right here, are all up in the mountains or down in the, in the canyon. Um, it's girls' night out and man camp uh, for the high school group this weekend, and so uh, the young men went down to Brownlee. I think they're camping at Woodhead Park, and the, the gals are all up at McCall, staying at the Wooten's Cabin. There's like 20 of them, and so... If you're familiar with Wooten's Cabin, you know it's packed like sardines um, all weekend. And so anyway, they're having a great time spending time building relationships with the kids and, and the, the adult volunteers and uh, investing in those kids God's word. And they're teaching them as well and um, teaching the, the men how to be men, um, real men crappie fish. And so I think that's what they were going to do part of the time. And uh, I don't know what the girls are going to do, but they'll, 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 they'll find a way. And again, on a personal note, we want to thank uh, you again for the opportunity to be gone on vacation. We were in Coeur d'Alene, um, right on the lake, uh, across the lake from, from the city, and it was just a beautiful place, and the leaves had just started to turn, and we got to go to, uh, to, to there and to Coeur d'Alene, but also we drove around North Idaho and saw the beauty uh, that God had made up there, and um, it's really the, some amazing scenery, and uh, if you've never traveled the St. Joseph River Byway, Scenic Byway, it's just a beautiful, beautiful stretch of, of valley that is, that is gorgeous. And uh, there's other places you probably don't want to get out of your car because they take their signs seriously that say trespassers will be shot. Um, so you got to be careful in some places. But it, overall, it was a, just a wonderful week. We got to see the girls last weekend. They came up from Moscow 
they got to spend some family time together, and, and they're doing well. So we're just grateful to God for that opportunity and um, thankful for uh, the ability to just go and, and rest and relax. Well, this morning as we look at Hebrews, the second half of chapter 2, I'm reminded, I was reminded as I studied this, um, of the, even in my lifetime, how families have been portrayed on TV. Now, this is, this is not rhetorical questions. I want hands raised. How many of you go back in TV land to Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver? <laughs> okay, a lot of you. Um, and, and, and then from, on, from there forward, we can go on to things like the Andy Griffith Show and My Three Sons and the Brady Bunch. And we move forward, you get family shows like the Cosby Show with their, with their family. <coughs> But one of the things you notice as you go along through time is families become increasingly dysfunctional, okay? Um, you, instead of the whole mother-father, mother-working-at-home traditional family, and then you move into widowed families and remarried widowed families like the Brady Bunch and, and so forth, until today you've got things like, what, the Simpsons, Modern Family, you know, that are the most dysfunctional families where father knows nothing instead of father knows best. And, and the, the, the state of the family in, over the last 50 years has really been reflected in those family shows. And to where, you know, I don't know about you, I can't even watch um, some of them uh, nowadays because the, the family is just totally changed uh, to something that's not even recognizable for us that were raised in solid healthy, functional families. Well, I thought about that because in this passage, I don't know if you noticed as I read it, what the writer is saying is, is that you truly are God's family. And I don't know if that is as awe-filling for you as it should be because we talk about it all the time, don't we? We're the family of God. And it almost becomes... So second nature that we lose the awe that comes from that. But we really are a family, spiritually, not just us. Don't we, we begin our Lord's Prayer with our Father who art in heaven. He's our Father. And then we sing songs like, uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. And he's a friend, but there's something in here that, that he's even more than a friend. He's a friend who is a brother. And, and to me this week it just blew my socks off. That Jesus is literally our brother, our big brother. Not big brother in the Orwellian 1984 sense. But, and, and what I have to do is I have, for some of you, you have to eliminate thoughts of dysfunctional, abusive families. Because the family that, that the writer of Hebrews is talking about is the best, healthiest, most functional family that you can imagine. Where God is our father and Jesus is our brother. And so, so get, mind, get out of your minds the, the uninvolved father, uh, the workaholic father, the abusive father. Get out of your mind the older brother that, that threw you in the mud puddle every day on the way to school. You know, those, those are not the images. We're thinking about the family as God intended it. And so we find in here that, that the idea of family comes up over and over again, especially in those first uh, four verses. Look what it says, in bringing many sons to glory, and that includes daughters. We're not sexist around here. The Bible isn't sexist. It, it implies both sons and daughters to glory, okay? And then it goes on and says um, in later, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. So they're brothers, they're sons. And then later when he quotes Psalms, he says, I will declare your name to my brothers. And then a little bit later in verse 13, the children God has given me. So the idea that the writer wants you to understand is, is that this is our family. Spiritually, we are part of a family. And it should just strike us with awe that God would make us his family. And so let's just go through it with that in mind. Is, is that this is the writer telling us our place in the family and the benefits of being in his family. And so the first thing he says in the beginning is that in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, everything exists, 
And again, notice this balance, and, and, and it's really important. Well, let me, go, let me take a step back. The first thing that comes out of his pen at this point is so important. In bringing many sons to glory. Did you ever think that that's what God's intention was, you from, was for you from the very beginning? Was to bring you into glory? He wants you to be the glorious person that he designed you to be, that he created you to be, to shape and to fashion, fashion you. He wants you to be part of his glory, to be in his glory, to be sons of glory. And so I think what the writer does is he balances that because, you know, if we were left at that, we might think that everything revolves around us. And that's why I think that he put on the next line. It was fitting that God for whom and through whom, through whom, through whom all things exist. So really, it, it's about God. And, and this, is, this is the balance that we always have to keep in mind because I get really frustrated with a camp that follows a certain group of teachers and so forth that says everything is about God. Nothing is about us. It's all about God. And unfortunately, what happens is, uh, as, as was portrayed in a, in a secular book that I read one time, when some people came upon God, and they found him, and he was gazing at the mirror, admiring himself. You know, that's sometimes the impression people get, is that God is this great universal narcissist that cares only about himself. But the reality is, he cares about us, because his design was to bring his children into glory. And so there's a balance. It's all about God, but God has made it all about us on this world, in this humanity. And you've got to keep those side by side and intertwined and always in mind that, that, yes, it's about God, but God has made it about us, which he makes clear because of what he was willing to give, what he was willing to do on our behalf that we couldn't do for ourselves. Somebody said that, that the... the ultimate reflection of God is how much, he was to get, how much he was to give for those who could do nothing for themselves. And that's what God is about, and bring many sons to glory. So our destiny is glory, and in a, in a couple of months we may be singing the song, we are the reason that he gave his life, he, we are the reason he suffered and died. That is both sides of that coin in essence. And then he goes on to say, so what did God do? What was it fitting for him to do? What was it appropriate for him to do? Even though he's the one for whom all things exist and through whom all things exist. It says he should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now that's an incredible statement. And, and it has to do with the whole life of Christ, not just the cross. We can't even conceive how much suffering was involved for Jesus to come to this world in the same human form that we're in. He gave up his relationship with the Father and the Spirit to depart from them and to enter into a fragile human body. That was suffering. And then throughout his life, he suffered. He suffered temptation in the desert. He suffered privations. He suffered relational issues with disciples who didn't understand. And then, of course, he had the ultimate suffering of being rejected by his own people and crucified by the Romans and the Jewish leaders. And so he knew suffering. And you might ask, but I thought Jesus was perfect. How can you make the author, and, and let me just, as a note, that word in Greek for author has a wide range of meanings, and author is certainly one of them, but, but I like the word better, pioneer. Jesus is the pioneer. He's the one that went first through this suffering. He's the one that went first gain our salvation. He was the one who cut his way through the jungle and made a path that all of us could follow along behind. And I, and I think that's probably the intention of the author is that he should become the pioneer of our salvation by being perfected, not as God, because as God, he was always perfect. But as a human savior, he had to be made perfect in suffering because he had to experience all of the pain and suffering that we as humans experience and we'll get to the reasons why by the end of that of this section so he says that that he made him perfect through suffering and goes on to say that both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family we're all of the same family and they're ta he's talking about jesus at that point not only is he holy but he's the one who is and and the niv kind of messes it up there's a little bit more nuance to it 
not who are made holy, but who are being made holy. And we're going to talk more about holiness in future messages because it's an important thing that comes up time and time again in Hebrews. But I think it's so important to understand that in Hebrews, it talks about holiness in three distinct, separate, overlapping ways. We have been made holy in the past because of what Jesus has done. We are in the process of being made holy, as the writer says right here. And it says one day we will be made holy in the future. It works throughout the spectrum, and it's, it's a realization that we're always in process. That we're always in process. There's a beginning place when we believe in Jesus, and then he begins to work in us, and he begins to make us holy with the future promises that we will be made completely holy at some future time. And, and we'll talk about that more in the future. But think about it. We are of the same family as the one who makes us holy and who's holy himself. And for that reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Jesus is our big brother. That's, that's the, one of the most outrageous claims, and it, it's, it, I think it's uncomfortable because in, in the history of hymns, you don't find that idea expressed very often in our singing, that Jesus is our brother. It actually came out more in the 60s in the Jesus People movement Um, that that Jesus is our brother, and sometimes you find it in some of the choruses of that era. But he is our brother. What an outrageous thing to think, that God would be our brother. And again, he's the perfect older brother, not the one that put mud in your hair, but the one that says that is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. You know what? Jesus is never ashamed of you. Doesn't that fill your heart with awe? No matter what we do, Jesus is not ashamed of us. Shame is a powerful thing, and we use it sometimes as a tool in dealing with one another. God doesn't do that. God doesn't shame us because he doesn't view us that way. Matter of fact, it says he openly acknowledges us. He openly states his claim on us as family. He's not ashamed to call them brothers. And then he quotes from Psalm 22. I will declare your name, that is your name, God. He's speaking to God. And it's it's interesting that it says Jesus said this because it wasn't really Jesus in the first place. It was David. But the writer is so convinced that Jesus fulfilled all that was promised in David that he can say, Jesus says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And he goes on and quotes Isaiah in in a verse. And And again, we don't have time to go into this in depth, but one of the things that uh, has become evident as as scholars have studied Scripture is when the New Testament writers quote a verse or a part of a verse, they are calling forth the whole context of what that passage is about. And so when he talks about it, it may not make total sense to us because we're not that familiar with the context of Isaiah chapter 8, where those last two quotes are from. But just to put it in its barest form, in that passage, Isaiah is being rejected by the Israelites. His message is being rejected. And he says, I will put my trust in him, God, despite the rejection. And in the same way, Jesus was willing to do that too. He was willing to trust his father despite the rejection that he was going to face from the Hebrew people, from the Israelites. And then he says, here am I and the children that God has given me. Those aren't his children, they're God's children, and therefore they're brothers and sisters to Jesus. That's his point over and over again, is that Jesus is not ashamed of us, and he's not ashamed to identify with us as he gives us a new identity. We're all part of that family. We're all part of his family. So that's that's the first thing that's so important to understand for the rest of the passage, because the next thing the rest of the passage gives us two main things that are a result of being a part of his family, of Jesus being our, our older brother. The first thing is, is that he acts like a loving brother. Look at verse 14. And again, and here is the incarnation, Jesus becoming human, flesh and blood over and over again. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's us. He too shared in their humanity, their flesh and blood, So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Is there a greater fear in the world than death? 
We know it comes to every one of us, but we fight it till the bitter end. Bitter end. We spend hundreds and hundreds and millions and billions of dollars on medical research to extend our lives because we want to grasp every bit of life now because we fear death. And what do we fear about death? Well, I think in the, from a worldly standpoint, we simply fear the unknown. We don't know what's coming. Um, if you don't have God's word as the basis for your life, to use the, collo the, the colloquial language, it's a crapshoot. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and so there's, that's a fearsome thing. Um, to, and it causes fear. And what has happened is, is that fear of death has become a tool, a weapon that the devil uses, that, the, that Satan uses. He says, you are going to be condemned. Death is going to be the end of you. Death is the final word. And then you're mine. And you know what? He also says things like, you know what? Death is the end, so you might as well live it up now and live my way. Because you'll be missing out on life if you don't live it the way I think it should be lived. And so there's all these arrows and swords that pierce us from the devil's own mouth because we fear death. But it says Jesus has freed us. He's freed us from that. And I think, for me, that has become one of the most important issues to come out of what it means to have your identity in Christ, to be free from fear and from the fear of death, is that we have a certain freedom. We have the freedom to live our lives the way God designed them. And again, it's, freedom is a, such a totally misunderstood um, thing because freedom for us oftentimes means free from constraint, that we can do whatever we want to. But scripture makes it cl clear that true freedom is to live the life that God designed the way he designed it. And in that, we have true freedom. So we can have that freedom from the fear of death, from the devil's weapons and threats hanging over our heads. It's interesting that he says to destroy him in verse 14 that holds the power of death. That word destroy is not annihilate or completely destroy as an another Greek word could be used. It's one that, has, again, has a range of meanings. It would be better to probably translate it, it, would, it makes the devil impotent. Now, I love that. The devil is impotent. Viagra is not going to help him, okay? He has no hope. He's been defeated. Jesus has done it. And he is a defeated foe who all he can do is lob in the grenades, shoot the arrows over the wall, do whatever he can to try to, to continue continue to cause us to fear. But he's impotent. Those arrows hold no fear for us. We don't have to be struck by them. We don't have to believe his lies. We have a certain freedom from the devil. But then we have the freedom to live life. And I, 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 I saw the title of a book this week that reminded me is being advertised. It's called Living a Braveheart Life. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Braveheart? Okay, good number of you. You remember the line... Uh, that was used to advertise that. All men die, but not all men truly live. That's what he's saying, is that we have the opportunity to truly live because we don't have to fear death, as William Wallace didn't. And he paid, with it for, his, with, he paid for it with his life. But until that life was taken, he lived a life of justice, seeking justice and seeking freedom for his people. And it's a great story if you haven't seen it. Um, very, uh, very graphic in its violence, but, but the story is incredible. But we have that freedom from the fear of death and because we know that our future is held by God and he will make us holy and he will bring us into his kingdom and so we have nothing to fear. So Jesus did that all, it says, by what? By his death. Okay, again, the, the, the crucifixion's in mind, the death on the cross. That's how he won our freedom, and that's how we're redeemed. A fancy way of saying our relationship with God is restored through his sacrifice. So Jesus acts as a loving older brother, and then he also helps as one aspect of that, those actions. He helps us, it says, for surely in verse 16, it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's seed, literally, Abraham's descendants. 
a little Pauline theology creeping in here because the writer, and I think the church of that century already knew about that whole idea that it was by faith that Abraham, uh, that, that God worked with Abraham's life. It was by faith and not the law. And, and it comes out here because it's Abraham's seed or Abraham's descendants that um, Jesus is after. And that word for help is a very graphic, literal word. It's used later in the, the epistle about how, G, how God came along in, in Egypt and just grabbed hold of his people and led them out. That's what it really literally means is that he comes along and takes hold of his people. And that's what it should be. For surely it is not angels he takes hold of, but he takes hold of us. And then he leads us in by hand by hand. And again, that picture of family is behind this. A family walking forward hand in hand as he helps us along in our struggles. So it's us that Jesus has done this for. And then in verse 17, he goes on to say, For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. I'm going to stop right there. This is the first time that the writer mentions being a high priest, but he's going to take that theme and develop it um, in several chapters in the middle of, the, of, of this book. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about priesthood because we're going to spend weeks talking about what that means. But for the time being, I just want you to notice those two adjectives that the writer describes that high priest with. He's both merciful and faithful. Okay? Those are the two aspects of what it meant to be a priest. The priest was representative of the people. And the high priest, specifically, one time a year, would go into the Holy of Holies, representing the people and the sins of the people with a sacrifice. And he had to do it sympathetically because he was representing their sin. And so he would go in as a merciful high priest, sympathetic to our experiences, sympathetic to our sin. Now, again, he's going to go into more detail later in the letter about how Jesus is like us in every way except for sin because he resisted sin. He was sinless in essence, but not because he was born that way, because he had power to, to deal with those temptations. And we'll talk more about that too. But, but in every other way, in our, in our frailty as human beings, the frailty of our bodies and our flesh, the weakness that we have, that was all part of Jesus' experience. And so he can be a sympathetic, merciful high priest. But that second one is just as important because not only does the high priest go in and represent the people, he goes in and he represents them to God. And so he becomes the representative of the people before God. And so this idea that he's faithful is that he's faithful and he's obedient to God as the representative of the people. It's, it's, it's a remarkable picture. And I don't know that without a background in sacrifices and temple like we have in the Old Testament that we grasp how fully and engaging this is as an illustration. Because in the atonement, Jesus is both the high priest and the sacrifice. Because he offers himself as a high priest, he offers himself as the Lamb of God. He is both high priest and sacrifice. And then that's what that last second part of the verse says, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Not by sacrificing an animal, not by sacrificing anything else, but by sacrificing himself for the sins of the people. And we talked about this a bit in our Sunday school class this morning. What an incredible thing that Jesus became a curse for us. That all of the sins of all of humanity was placed upon him on the cross. And because of that, we can have a right relationship with God the Father. We can have a right relationship with him. We can, we can know reconciliation and redemption. So Jesus is that merciful and faithful high priest. You see how, as we've gone over just the first few weeks of Hebrews, everything in it points to Jesus. That Jesus is superior to angels. He's superior to everything that has gone before. Next week, we're going to look how he's superior to Moses. And, and so it's all about Jesus and what he has done and why he's superior and then verse 18 concludes, really the purpose of this whole passage to this point. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, in his fragile human body, 
with his weaknesses as a human being. He was tempted and he suffered, but he endured them and he got through them and resisted them and didn't give in to them. And as a result, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That's you and me. When we're tempted, we have Jesus available right here, right now. And it's a very appropriate thing to say out loud or in your spirit, Help, Jesus! I need your help! Because he's always there, and he sympathizes, and he was obedient, and he will give us the resources that we need to help, to come beside, to reach out and to grasp and to hold on to us in the midst of that temptation. And so I want to leave you with a difficult image, a difficult thought experiment, because I got to thinking this week. We tried to communicate from the very beginning that the great temptation that the readers of this letter were facing in the middle of the first century was to walk away from Jesus, was to go back to their Judaism or to go back to their paganism because their pressures on them were so great because it seemed like it might be worth it to, to escape the temptation and to forsake Jesus and to go backward. And I got to get a sneaking suspicion that a lot of you might think, well, that's not a, such a big temptation. I'm never going to go back. I'm never going to deny Christ the way Peter did. I am so confident in him. There's nothing that would ever cause me to consider going back. There's nothing to go back to. But I want to give you this little thought experiment. We know about the tragedy of this last week in Roseburg, don't we? If you've been reading, you know, have a pretty good idea of how it went down because there were witnesses that were right there. So let me just have you put yourself as a student in that classroom in Roseburg. And a man comes in with a gun and he tells everybody to hit the floor. And the whole class is out of their seats and on the floor, and you're one of them. And then one by one, he asks people to stand up and to state their religion. Now, the first person that gets up doesn't have a clue what's going on. Probably doesn't even consider what his answer may or may not cause to happen. But the first person gets up and says, I'm a Christian. And bam, he's shot in the head. Now, the second person knows exactly what's going to happen. At that moment, would it be tempting to not say I'm a Christian? To say, oh, I'm nothing. I don't have any faith. I don't believe. If you knew that in the next moment you'd be shot in the head, that's a difficult thing. And for most of our lives, we've never had to face that possibility because we've been comfortable and we've been dominant as a religion in our culture. But Christianity is slowly being marginalized to where it can become a target. This week, from an evil young man. Next week, from an evil government, as the first century Christians had to face with Rome. Who knows? But the temptation for them was as real as it was for those students in that classroom and could be as well for us. So ask yourself, do we need Jesus' resource to say, looking down the end of a gun, yes, I am a Christian? may not be as easy as we think. Let's pray. Lord, we want to lift up those in Roseburg who have suffered such great loss this last week. The family members of those who were shot and killed, we lift them up to you and may they be comforted and know um, that for many of those that died, they died professing faith in you, in Jesus. Lord, we just, sometimes hard to comprehend. Lord, for those who are still in the hospital recovering, we just pray for their restored health. We pray for their families too as they walk with them and Lord, we pray for that whole community of Roseburg and, uh, 
as we follow the news, we know that that has brought them together. Um, there are some people of faith there. There are others that aren't. I just pray, Lord, that your church would be the light and the salt that you intended it to be. And, Lord, I pray for each one of us. May we be so fully committed to you that we will never hesitate to respond to a question. Yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a believer in Jesus because of what he did for me. And I have no fear of death because I know he waits for me on the other side. May that just be so ingrained in our hearts and minds and spirits uh, that, that we would go with you anywhere. And Lord, I would pray for the, the many here that we would have a William Wallace, brave heart kind of life, that we would know the freedom that comes from fear being taken care of for the devil being shut up and ineffectual and impotent, and that we can go about our lives, uh, Lord, with confidence and courage um, in all that we face and all that we do. And may we always look to you for strength uh, when we face temptation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yes. I'm a follower of Jesus. So let's stand together and let's just unite our voices in that praise that makes our faith more solid. How great is our God.
just the natural thing that we do in our love for Jesus? Surrender. Surrender your life. Lay it all down. surrender. We lay it down. We know that we, we hold tightly to life, to comfort, to the things that we hold dear, Lord, that we, we move farther from you. So let us lay it down and surrender it. Father, just infiltrate us with your Holy Spirit and fill us up. Let that be all we need. In Jesus' name. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You are our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. 
of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord there's nothing could ever come close no thing can compare you are our living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord oh, Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the time Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. You know, really our goal is to send you out of here this morning with a song in your head that you can't get rid of all day long. So stand up and sing with us. All the people said amen. One, two, three, four. You not alone. If you are lonely, when you feel afraid, you're not the only, we are all the same. In need of mercy, to be forgiven and be free. It's all you got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends And all the people said Amen If you're rich or poor, well it don't matter Weak or strong, you know love is what we're after We're all broken but we're all in this together God knows we stumble and we fall and he so loved the world, he sent his son to save us all. And all the people said, Amen. Oh, and all the people 
said amen Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends And all the people said amen Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart Blessed are the people hungry for another star for oh, this is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>